Good evening, everybody. The word of the day is punctuality. It's not? You don't have my calendar then, do you? He said, thank you. Kicking rocks again. <laughs> yes, uh, um, yeah, the, we weren't really ready to start, but 6.30 we start. And so he's like, did we go? And I'm like, yeah, we go. Because we were punctual. <laughs> right? All right, guys. Um, another glorious opportunity to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Another chance to dive into the Word, to find out what the Holy Spirit has in store for us, to learn from Him this evening. And Father, we look forward to what He has in store for us. I thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, really interesting um, concepts that uh, we're going to talk about this evening. Real quick, show of hands. How many? Thank you. I love it when I do that. Steve's like, first one, here's my hand. See it? Showing it. Done. Okay. But what do I need to do? Ask the question, then say show hands? <laughs> All right. So how many people have ever been in an argument or a debate where you've had been on one side and the opposite has been on the other side and you've tried to decide or come to an, like a, an agreement? Anybody ever been on an argument or a debate trying to convince? Yeah. Every single one of us have been on an argument. We've... We've met somebody and we've had differing opinions. And then you share your opinion and your evidence. They share their opinion, their evidence. And there's, there's a debate that occurs, right? Everybody knows what a debate is. Few of us have probably been on debate teams. I remember back in my uh, middle school days, I was actually on a debate team um, for one year. So that was fun and I quit. So <laughs> debating is not my thing. It, you, know, you come to me with your opinion, I give you my opinion. If you don't agree with me, I go, well, have a nice day. I'm done with you, you know. So when I was in middle school, I was not that kind of person. But in all actuality, the more that I've grown up and the more that I've you know, started to read the Word of God, the more I understand that part of our role is to be on a debate team because there are two differing aspects the way that this world runs, those who are for God and those who are against Him. Amen? And you, being a born-again believer, I hope and pray, you're on the first side, the four side. So when we go out to this dark and dying world, our job is to be on a debate team. It's our job to give the word of God, give our side, give our evidence. And then they, of course, because everybody has an opinion, right? Everybody, everybody has been raised with an opinion. So they're going to give their side. So there, there's that debate. There's that back and forth conversation. And what we're going to learn tonight is there are four levels of debate that Jesus dealt with when he spoke with the Pharisees. You see, Jesus came, like we learned over the past few weeks, to redefine what it means to, to truly live in his ministry, to define what it means to worship the Father. So that's what Jesus did. His ministry was to reset what had been years and years of of turmoil and years and years of you know taking what God had ordained and twisting it for man's own own perspective. So Jesus comes to fulfill and create a new. So he has to explain this newness to people who are set in their ways, right? Everybody understands the Pharisees didn't want to change. So he had to enter into a debate. So this evening we are going to be in John chapter 8. So if you want to turn your Bibles with me and read along, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to be at the very end of John chapter 8. And as you guys are kind of turning there, let me give you kind of a summary of what's going on so far. So, so Jesus is speaking with the Pharisees, and they see that he is going against their order. He is speaking in a way that will crumble what they have set up. And so they've got to figure out a way to catch him. And we talked about this over the past couple of weeks, that one of the things the Pharisees did was they tried to say things to Jesus to catch him. As soon as they catch him, they can debunk him, right? That was their whole mission. Satan started this from, from Jesus' ministry. That's what he did. He tried to tempt Jesus to catch him. Do things that go against God's will, and as soon as Jesus says, yes, you're right, they got him, right? That was the Pharisees' whole mission, was to try to catch him. And multiple times through the book of John here in chapter 8, if you go back, this is a long, long chapter. It's like 59 verses, and we're going to start in verse 48. 
But if you go back, you can read, there's like nine, ten different times where the Pharisees try to catch Jesus. They say something, and then they're waiting for that response. Come on, get yourself. And, the, and as soon as Jesus says something, they're like, ah, I got you, I ah, see everybody. And then they go, oh, look what, he, look what he's saying. You know, that's, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to catch him. So nine, diff ten different times, they try to catch Jesus. But Jesus, the true son of God, knows what they're trying to do. And he never, ever bends or breaks. One of the things that I want you to see as we talk about the scripture tonight is I want you to see how even though Jesus knew what they were trying to do, even though Jesus knew full well that he was about ready to go to a cross, he was still trying to set people free. Even the Pharisees, even the Sadducees, even the people who were persecuting him right to his face, he was still trying to witness to them. I want you to notice that as we, as we discuss these scriptures this evening, that Jesus was still trying to save souls. So I want you to catch that. So again, we're going to be reading out of the book of John, chapter 8. Give me an amen if you're there. Thank you. I ask you to stand for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. We're going to read verses 48 to the end. <clears throat> read with me. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Let us pray. Oh, Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for the breath of life that you've given us today. We thank you so much for keeping us safe and bringing us back to your house of prayer and your house of praise. We thank you so much, Lord, that we continue to read your word and be transformed by it. And Father God, I pray that that's what happens this evening. Lord, I pray that you will speak hearts and minds, be transformed by your word today. Lord, I pray that you will get rid of the distractions in our lives. Set us free from all the things that are coming and let us focus on what is here and here and now. Father, I pray that you will just let every single person under my voice who calls themselves a born-again believer realize and recognize what it means to truly be born again. Sharing the gospel of Jesus to this dark and dying world even as they blaspheme and persecute us. Lord, I pray that tonight you would just help me to get out of the way. I am a sinner, full of sin, Lord. But Father God, you can speak through this vessel. And so, Lord, I pray that you will. I pray that you will get me out of the way and speak through me with power and authority. Anoint me from on high, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet once more to speak your word and to be transformed by it myself. Lord, we look forward to what you have in store for us this evening. As always, we ask nothing but your will to be done. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. <clears throat> so, here we are. Jesus is standing before the Pharisees one more time, and he gets into a debate. So if you're taking notes this evening, I want you to write three things down. You'll notice in these scriptures, there's a back and forth discussion. The Pharisees say something, and then Jesus responds. And then the Pharisees say another thing, and then Jesus responds. There's this back and forth. What I want, I want you to notice is when Jesus responds, he responds in three specific ways. 
Through the scriptures we just read, there are three instances. The first two instances that Jesus responds, he responds with truth and then grace. The third thing is what the Pharisees do, blasphemy. So it goes every single order. The first time it's blasphemy, truth, then grace. The second section is blasphemy, truth, and grace. And the third time in this set of scripture is blasphemy and truth. And it stops. So I want you to notice that as we go through these, see the debate, the back and forth. Blasphemy, truth, then grace. All right? So let's look at these first few scriptures here. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So there's your blasphemy. The very first thing that occurs is Pharisees blaspheme Jesus by saying, number one, you're a Samaritan, and number two, you have a demon. So let's first work with the, the first specific example here. What's a Samaritan? We all know. When the kingdom split in two, the northern kingdom, their capital was Samaria, and so the, all the people who lived in the northern kingdom were pretty much known as Samaritans, and then your southern kingdom, that was Judah, this is where Jerusalem was. This is where the temple was. And so they called themselves the true Jews, the true worshipers, the true Israelites. So there was a, a bit of some tension there. Imagine, imagine like Virginia and West Virginia back in the Civil War days. We were all brothers of the same, cut from the same stone, but there was some tension. And the reason why there was this tension was because Samaria, when they were captured and there was a battle, they were exiled and then pagan warrior, pagan people moved into the area and the Samaritans intermarried with them. And so the Judah people, the Judeans, the Jews, the southern kingdom looked to the northern kingdom as, as traitors. They looked at them and said, you completely turned away from what Abraham and Isaac and Jacob taught, which was to not commingle with the enemy, the pagans. And the Samaritans did. They intermarried. And they allowed pagan rule to come in. So to a Jew, a Samaritan was like a Nazi to us. When someone says, I'm a Nazi, you instantly get that bad taste in your mouth, like, oh, we got a problem here, don't we? There's that negative connotation by a simple phrase, a simple word. Same for the Jews. When they heard somebody was a Samaritan, ugh, they got that nasty you know, crawl in their mouth. Ugh, this, you're a Samaritan. They wanted nothing to do with Samaritans. So for, for the Pharisees to actually call Jesus a Samaritan, that was pretty much a derogatory name. They called him a name. They, they, they basically called him a bad word, you know. The way that the Jews looked at Samaritans, calling Jesus a Samaritan was, was disgusting. And the second thing that they called him was that he had a demon. Now, this is interesting. All throughout Scripture, the Pharisees always seem to want to go towards calling Jesus, like, you're, you're demon-possessed or, or you're, you're with Satan. And Jesus multiple times had to debunk them and say, look, a house divided against itself cannot survive. If I am truly demon-possessed, I'm out here preaching the gospel. I'm preaching God in the heavenly kingdom. I can't go against Satan and his kingdom by preaching godly kingdom. That's divided, right? So Jesus does this multiple times throughout Scripture. We, we can tell that Jesus is like, how in the world is this even possible that you would say that I'm demon-possessed? But... That's what they always kept going to. They kept saying, you must be possessed by a demon. So, before we get any further, this is an intellectual portion, okay? The Pharisees are starting to use their brains. They know that by calling Jesus a name and by labeling him demon-possessed, the people around might start to go, ah, okay, if he really is those two things, then maybe we shouldn't follow him. So they're using their brains. They're trying to pit the people against Jesus. And that's how debates all begin. When we go to people, we come with our smarts. We start with the intellectual, our evidence, right? We don't come at them with fisticuffs. Hey, I don't agree with you, and I want to get you to agree with me, so let's start fighting. No, we don't start there, do we? When we're in a debate, we go to people and we say, hey, I noticed that you're not doing something, and you should be doing it, and so here's why you should be doing it. You start that intellectual discussion. So this is like level one of our debate. They are debating, the Pharisees are debating with Jesus and using their brains. That's the intellectual level. So that's where we begin. So then Jesus responds. So again, we went blasphemy. Now we're at truth. How does Jesus respond? Does he lash out at them? No, he responds with truth. The first thing he says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father 
and you dishonor me. Notice, he doesn't blast them. He doesn't lash out at them. He responds with a calm, cool, collective answer. This is how we should respond in persecution. When someone comes to you, calls you a name, a Samaritan, or says that your, your God doesn't exist, or you're a demon, or you're a hater, you do not respond in a negative way. You come at them calm, cool, and collective, just like Jesus, and you say, I'm here to honor my Father in heaven, just like Jesus does. He doesn't blast them. He says, I don't have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. So he tells them, he says, the way you're treating me, you call yourselves followers of Yahweh. You call yourselves believers in God the Father, and yet you treat me the way you've been treating me. How can you honor God and treat me this way? See, Jesus uses their own attitudes right back at him. This is a great way to debate against a a, a, another church person. Think about it. If you go to another denomination or you go to another person who attends church and they have a disagreement and you start in that intellectual world, as soon as they start ramping up and calling you names, that's when you, you can say, look, how can you say that you're a person that goes to church and treat me the way you're treating me or say things the way that you're... How can you do that? If you're a true born-again believer, a follower of a church, like, how can you treat me this way? It's a great way, great ammunition to attack somebody, or not attack, but to defend yourself against somebody's attacks, right? So that's what Jesus does. Is he, he says, how can you say that you are a follower of Yahweh, a believer in the Mosaic law, and treat me this way? I honor my father and you dishonor me. So he gives them that truth. He hits them with the truth. And then we follow that up with grace. You see, Jesus is still working. He still is trying to pull people in. So in verse 51, he says, most assuredly, I say to you, or sorry, 50, and I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. In verse 50, Jesus is not seeking after his glory. You see, the Pharisees, they're seeking after their own glory. Jesus is not. And we actually can turn, if you will, with me to John chapter 17. Flip over a few, a few pages. This is really interesting. When I was studying for this, did you know, well, we all know that Jesus existed from the beginning, right? Everybody knows that. Did you know that when Jesus left his throne and he came to earth, that he actually gave up his glory for us. Look at John chapter 17, verse 5. John chapter 17, verse 5 says this, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Which I had. Notice the past tense. You see, when Jesus left his throne and stepped down to come into a humble birth and to walk this earth for 33 years, he gave up his own glory to be with us. Isn't that cool? And so when we come back to John chapter 8, Jesus is telling them, I am not seeking after my own glory. He's not after his glory. He's not trying to build himself up. He's trying to tell every single person about God the Father. You say you're a follower, Pharisee, Sadducee. You say you're a believer. You say that you believe in the Mosaic law. I stand before you to fulfill the law. And you are seeking after your own glory, and I'm not. But he always turns it back to God the Father. There is one who seeks and judges. See, he says that God the Father is the one who deserves the glory, not me. That's humble. God in the flesh standing before them. And he says, I'm not here to glorify myself. Isn't that cool? Jesus was not about glorifying himself. He was about always turning it back to God the Father. That's cool. Jesus gave up his glory when he comes down to earth. And he turns it back to God the Father and says, there's the one who you should be glorifying. 
There's the one who will judge one day your works, your beliefs. There's the one. So he gives them truth again. Now we're at 51 where he gives them grace. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. See, there's an invitation. Pharisees, Sadducees, elders, you guys have been blasting me for a few verses. Now we're down in verse 48. So he's been doing it for a while. But Jesus always is seeking to save the lost, and he invites them in. He says, most assuredly, maybe your Bibles may say truly, truly. Whenever you see most assuredly or truly, truly, this was like a person standing before you, grabbing you by the collar and saying, you've got to listen to what I have about to say. Because what I'm about to say is absolutely on point. Pay attention. This is, this is a grasping of attention. Truly, truly, most assuredly, I say to you, this is Jesus trying to get through the walls that they've put up, trying to get through their defenses, trying to appeal to them and say, listen, listen to what I'm about to tell you. And he says, listen, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, does this mean physical death? No, this is not physical death. This is eternal death. The word see here, that he shall, he shall never see death. The word see here is not actually visually seeing because every single person under my voice, myself included, we will see death. One day, when our time comes, we will no longer be on this earth. We will see death. But what Jesus is saying is, is that you will not hold on to this death because once we are absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. We will see death. It will come. Every single one of us. There's nothing you can do about it. It will come. But when it comes, you will be reborn to a new body with your Lord and Savior. So Jesus tells them, if you keep my word, you will have eternal life. You're still going to die, but you will not have the eternal death. This is the death that's spoken about in Revelation when the second coming comes and everybody is cast into the lake of fire who does not have the Lamb's book of life and their name written in it, the eternal death. He's trying to appeal to them, keep my word and you'll never see death. I just want you to listen, Jesus tells them. There's a cool saying that says, I don't want to be there when it happens because I'm not afraid of death, but I don't want to be there when it happens. Every single one of us who are born again believers should not fear death. And it's really hard for me because I, I am truly one of those people who is not afraid of death because I know the second my body is done here, I'm going to be in a glorious place. And it's really hard for me to empathize with people who have lost loved ones. And I know based upon their life and their attitude and the way that they live their life, I know that they're saved. And so I know where they are. And people come to me and they're bawling their eyes out and they're crying. And they're like, well, uh, uh. it just, it gets back to this whole, we need to stop praying saints out of heaven. People who are on their deathbed, ready to go to heaven. It's really hard for us to go, but I want to keep a hold of them. I want to hold on to them, right? It's really hard for us because we in this human form, we want to hold on to as long as we can. But folks, where they're going next, if they're born again, way better than what you got going on around here. Amen? I was listening to Caleb the other day and um, the, uh, I can't remember what their name is, Scott and Kelly, I think is their names, who they are. Um, they were talking about how um, one of them had lost a recent loved one. They, they, and he was, he was really, you could hear it in his voice. He was like, you know, I, I'm really tore. <clears throat> Cancer got a hold of him, took him way earlier than he should have. And then he begins to talk about the man's life and how the life that he lived and he gave everything to the Lord and he this, that, and the other. And he's like, I'm going to miss him and I wish the cancer would have been cured and I wish he would have stayed. Like he kept saying all this stuff and I'm just shaking my head going, hey, if he truly was born again, he's in a much better place than what you're offering, right? And so that's me. I, I'm sorry if that upsets you or steps on your toes, but that's how I am. I'm like, I, I don't fear death because I know that when God's time happens, God's time happens. And we need to stop praying saints out of heaven and say, if it's God's will, let it be done. 
Amen? When it's time, it's time. You pray for healing. You pray for comfort. You pray for understanding and discernment. But don't pray that God keeps them from heaven. Because that's where everybody wants to go. Amen? Everybody wants to go there. Much better place. And Jesus tells them, if you keep my word, you'll never see death. Don't fear death. Don't fear. Because if you are a born-again believer, where you're going next, way better than what we got going on here. So we hit blasphemy, we hit truth, and then we hit grace. Here we are, the Pharisees, they get excited. Verse 52, then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead in the prophets, and you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Look at how excited the Pharisees are. Ha, we got you. Ha, ha. You said that you would, if you believe that you'll never see death, how can you say that when Abraham, our father, is dead? When the prophets who prophesied are dead, how can you say that? They thought they got him. And they get excited. They're like, ha, ha, got you. See, the Pharisees, that's their whole, that's their whole mentality. Every single word that they tested Jesus was an attempt to get him in a gotcha moment. And they think they got him. Because Jesus tells them, if you follow my word, you will not see death. And they hear that and they don't think. They don't ask Jesus, hey, can you explain that? Can you, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? No. They hear the word, you'll see death, and they go, ah. And they go back to, well, Abraham's died. The prophets are dead. What do you mean? See, after all of this time, you can see there's been no progress. Jesus is trying to get them, trying to just please listen to what I have to say, and they are not listening at all. There's been absolutely no progress. They have no desire to understand anything Jesus is doing. Their, are, their only goal is to stop him from messing up what they got going on because what they got going on is good to them. That's their only goal. Their only goal was to denounce him in front of his followers. So he says, they say, now that you have a demon, we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. This is interesting. I learned this on the way. C.H. Spurgeon, everybody's ever heard of him, C.H. Spurgeon? He actually says this in, in the commentary. He says, no man can be said to have a devil or demon inside of them and at the same time honor God. Because the evil spirit from the beginning inside of you is an enemy to anybody that glorifies the Father. So think about that. Anybody who glorifies God can not be demon-possessed. They can be oppressed. Okay, the devil and his minions can push down on you, make life pretty miserable. But you cannot be demon-possessed and glorify God because a person who is demon-possessed is controlled by a demon, and a demon cannot glorify God. So if that's the case, how in the world do these Pharisees think that they can get away with saying that Jesus is demon-possessed? We know you have a demon inside you now because you're glorifying the Father. That absolutely makes no sense, does it? They didn't think that. They didn't think, how in the world can he even have a demon? But that's where they go. We know you have a demon now because Abraham and the prophets are all dead. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Who do you make yourself out to be? What a statement. Who do you think you are, Mr. Big Stuff, right? That's what they think. They think they got him. So, again, blasphemy. The Pharisees hit him. We got you now, buddy. Does Jesus respond in anger, frustration? No. Truth. 54, verse 54, Jesus says, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. They keep claiming that they are followers of God. They keep claiming that he is their God, and yet they continue to blaspheme Jesus. And he says, how can you call yourself a follower of God? You say that he is your God, and yet you do not represent him at all. That's the church in America, folks. I have been to many churches, and I have been to 
many of these conventions and talk to a lot of people in the areas who go to church, and you can tell by the way they act and the way they talk that they are not really Christians. They go to church. They check their box. They make their country club. They pay their country club dues, you know. They're a part of all the events. They make sure that their name is out there. They make sure everybody sees them in their nice fancy dresses and their fancy cars. They make sure that they're honored and glorified. But they are not honoring God the Father in their actions, in the way they talk, the things that they're a part of. They can't be. They are just as sinful as these Pharisees who blaspheme Jesus to his face and say on the flip side, we believe in God. The same exact people. Jesus tells them, how in the world can you represent God the Father? How in the world can you say that he is your God if you continue to talk to me the way that you're talking to me? God has reaffirmed multiple times that Jesus is his son. Remember during the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah stand before Jesus and Jesus transfigures into this white glorious figure? What does God say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and he comes out and the water comes down, what does God say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. God has reaffirmed multiple occasions that Jesus is his son. And if that's the case, then these Pharisees are blaspheming God right to his face. God has reaffirmed that Jesus is the son. And yet they continue to say that they are followers of God. You can tell. No, you ain't. Straight up. No, you ain't. In 55, he says, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. That's a slap in the face, amen? If I was Jesus and in his shoes at this time, and these people are coming at me and saying, because we believe in God and what you're saying is blasphemy against the God that we follow, and I respond back and say, if I say that I know God, I'm a liar like you, oh boy, you can feel the blood boiling now. You see, we talked about the first level of debate is that intellectual level. There's a second level. That's the emotional level. This is the level where blood starts to curdle. People start saying, you know what? No longer are you getting where I'm trying to lay down. You're no longer are you hearing what I'm trying to say. So now I'm going to start getting angry. I'm going to start moving. The emotion kicks in. That's level two. When debates make it to level two, there ain't no turning back. Because when emotion gets involved... You're not going to get through to anybody. You start telling somebody that the way they're living is wrong and they start getting angry, you're not going to get back to level one. You cannot appeal to somebody who's mad. You might as well quit and walk away. Once you get to level two, there ain't no turning back. Watch out for the emotional level. When you start to tell people about Jesus, when you start to try to debate somebody and they get emotional, you, you've lost them. Might as well back off, say, look, I, I tried. Well, we'll talk about this another time. And you walk away. Pharisees, they get emotional. He tells them, he says, how in the world can you even say that you're a follower of God? Because if you are, you're a liar. You don't know him, but I do. I know him and keep his word. Christian, how good are you at keeping his word? Well, if you're anything like me, you ain't really good at it. We fall and we fail every single time, every single day multiple times but it is our go job it is our goal to honor him and try to keep his word more so tomorrow than we did today amen so then he responds again so we had blasphemy then we have truth but now comes grace 56 your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad See, he comes back at him and says, Abraham, you believe in Abraham. You believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham saw my day, and he was glad. The same Abraham that you're talking about is the same Abraham who saw me. Think about that. You might follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and if you bring Abraham up, it's the same Abraham who saw me rule. That means that Abraham has seen Jesus. Think about that. 
Abraham has seen Jesus, and he was glad in the day that Jesus would come down. Jesus tells him, if the Abraham that you're following was glad, you need to change. You need to trade in that bitterness and that blasphemy. Get rid of that anger and turn it back to joy. When you come to church, do you come here angry and bitter and you're like, oh, well, I have to be here again? Are you upset? Do you have that nasty face when you walk in here? Who are you following? Who are you kidding? You're not kidding God. He knows. He knows better. Folks, showing up here is not enough. Just coming in through the doors and sitting down is not enough. God wants a relationship. He doesn't want your bitterness. He doesn't want your scowl. He doesn't want your nasty face. He wants joy in your heart. And that's what Jesus is telling him. Hey, you believe in Abraham, then hey, he was happy when he saw me. You should be happy. Get rid of your bitterness. God will bless all nations. Remember, in the book of Genesis, God told Abraham, through you, I will bless all nations. And he's telling them, the same person that God said he would bless is the same person who sent me. Get rid of your bitterness. Be excited and happy when you come here. Right? But yet, for some odd reason, there's a few of us just, just come here with nasty faces on all the time. Amen? Yeah. So verse 56, so he says, rejoice, rejoice for my day and be glad. Now remember, we went one and two. Here's the third time. This is where we get blasphemy and truth, but we don't get grace this time. So verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? It's interesting that he calls him 50 years old. I think somebody would have had to have been a lot older than 50 at this point to have seen Abraham. Amen? I mean, I'm not no yearly scholar, but I'm pretty sure there's been a few thousand years that have passed between the moment Abraham walked the earth to the moment that Jesus stands before them now, right? A few thousand years. This is a joke, right? I mean, the Pharisees are absolutely draw, you know, grasping at straws. How, you're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? What? You're not even 60 years old and haven't seen Abraham. That's what I would have responded. Like, what are you doing? This is, you're a joke. Okay. Well, Jesus, he doesn't respond in anger. He doesn't respond in frustration. He gives them truth. He gives them the most powerful truth. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, there's that word again. Look, truly, truly, what I'm about to say, I got you by the collar. Pay attention. Because what's coming next is beyond extremely important. Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Folks, there are two words in the Bible that just crush my spine, and it's those two words. There are two words in the Bible that send tingles up every single orifice, every single nook and cranny of my body, and it's those two words, I am. We've been preparing for the drama this come Saturday. And there's a portion in the drama where Jesus stands before the, the Roman guards. They're there to, to arrest him and to take him into captivity, to take him to Pilate and to go through the process of the crucifixion. And Jesus stands in front of these Roman soldiers, the chief priest, the chief priest guards, the Pharisees, stands in front of all these people. And he asks the soldiers, who are you seeking? The Roman soldiers say, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And how does Jesus respond? I am he. Ooh. I told him, I said, look, we need to be in character. I'm trying to explain to them. I'm the actor, the director, the writer, the producer. Like, I do all this crap. So I'm trying to tell them, guys, listen, you come up here with some power and authority. You got some swagger in your step. When you stand up here and you're like, I'm looking for Jesus, you put some pomp in, right? You pop those chests back and you say, where's he at? But the second... The second Jesus says, I am he, you are jello. You don't fall down. You don't drop to your knees. You don't, you know, collapse. But everything you thought you were, you ain't nothing. When Jesus stands in front of you and says, I am he, you better quiver. Because, folks, when he says, I am, these two words, that is the name of God right there. Jesus is actually 
calling out the name of God in front of these people. The same thing that God told Abraham when he, Abraham says, who shall I say is sending me? God says, I am. The name of God, the very name of God, Jesus says to these Pharisees. Now think about it. These Pharisees, they're in this old Mosaic law, and we all have heard multiple times that God's name was not to be spoken. It was not to be spoken. That was an absolute off the label, no limit. God's name was so righteous, so holy, that the Pharisees said, His name is never to be said by human mouths because we are unrighteous, we are unworthy to even mention His name. So throughout all the Old Testament scriptures, throughout all the scrolls that you go look out, they have stricken the name of God. They would have taken the name of God and removed letters, shrunk it down because it was so important to never say the name. That's how important this was. And Jesus stands right in front of them and says, God's name. You want to talk about blood boiling. If these Pharisees we're standing there, and they know the law, and they know full well the name of God is not spoken, and he says it right in front of them. What do you think they did next? They turned it up to level three. That's what happened. Level three in our, in our discussion. Level three, we had intellectual is our first one. Then we had emotional. We got emotional. Now we're about to get verbal. This is when they start calling the names. If you're in a debate and you pass emotional level two, and you come into level three, and they start calling you names, there, you talk about level two is there ain't no going back. Level three, there ain't no going back to level two. You have crossed the line. In a debate, if you start getting name called, <laughs> level four is fight. Level four is physical. That's when a fight's about to break out. And that's exactly what happens next. Because when Jesus says the name of God in front of these people, they lose their minds. Look at verse 59. He sa after he says, I am, they took up stones to throw at him. That's level four, folks. We's about to go down, throwing fisticuffs. You say the name of God, and we're going to go back to the Leviticus law that says anybody who blasphemes God's name is deserving of being stoned. So they grabbed stones to kill him right then and there. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You have crossed into level four in your debate. Physical altercation. Throwing stones. You're going to die. That's how far off they went. There ain't no grace here at this point. They blasphemed. Jesus gave truth. There wasn't time for grace. Because at this point, Jesus sees himself. He hides he hid himself and he went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. There were so many people inside of this building listening to this altercation, listening to this debate, that when they crossed into level four and they started to get ready to chuck stones, Jesus was able to hide himself through the people, snuck out and left the temple. And look where we're at. For three weeks we've been talking about the temple. For three weeks we've been talking about the first, second, and the new. And here we are again. Not by chance, but by God incidents. That Jesus stands in the temple, the very temple we learned about last week, and he says the name of God, I am. Jesus ain't got time for grace this time. There comes a time, Christian, I'm talking to you. There comes a time when you are called to go and debate, to go and tell somebody, something that they disagree with, to give them the intellectual side first, to give them the evidence first, to give them the truth first. But there comes a time when level two, three, and four start to move forward. And I told you, once you get to level two and they start getting emotional, there ain't no going back. But if you keep pushing buttons, they're going to move from emotional to calling you names. And if they cross from the name calling and the cussing, level four hits and they start throwing fisticuffs, right? Once you get to that emotional level, you've lost them. Sometimes I've watched a lot of these street preachers and these evangelists. Really good ones are the ones who will stand there and as they're getting blasted, name called, cussed at, all of it, even pushed and shoved sometimes, they stay calm, cool, and collected and say, look, I am here to just give you truth. You don't want to listen to it? That's fine. But I am not going to move. I'm not going to allow you to intimidate me 
And I am not going to change what I believe to be truth from the word of God. I stand firm on the solid rock and I come here to proclaim the gospel to you. You don't want to hear it? That's fine. But I'm going to stay right here. I've seen multiple preachers multiple times be threatened and stand firm and say, look, I'm going to give you truth. So Christian, I tell you that there comes a time when it starts to get bad, when they get into that level four and those fisticuffs, that physical altercation seems imminent, that it's okay to walk away. It's best to give grace and say, you're not going to listen? Okay. Just like Jesus, these Pharisees, he tried and he tried. And this last time, he crossed the line to them. Did he say anything that was false? No. Did he say anything that was blasphemous? No. Every word out of his mouth was absolute truth, but they couldn't handle it. And so because they couldn't handle it, Jesus walked away. It's okay, Christian, to walk away. The Holy Spirit will convict you and say, enough's enough. You've planted seeds, you've done everything you can, but enough's enough. It's okay, Christian, you can walk away. Throughout this entire set of scripture, we saw the three sets, the blasphemy, the truth, and the grace, rinse, repeat. In no time does Jesus condemn. In no time does he say, you're going to hell. In no time does he give up until it's too late. To the moment when physical altercation is about to occur, no time before that does he give up. He is still trying to win souls. That's our job, folks. That's our duty. That's our calling. That's our goal. There are false people out there, false people, lost people, dying people that are still loved by him. We can't see it sometimes. There are people in this world that I look at and go, I don't want to be anywhere around, about it, around that person. God loves them. So we should love them too. They might be persecuting you. They might be calling you names. They might be blaspheming you. They may be pushing and shoving. But they are the mission field. Our mission is to go and to spread the gospel of Jesus. And they are the field we do it in. They are the mission field. It is our job. Even while we are being persecuted, even while they're calling us names, even while they are laughing in our faces and spitting on our shoes, you respond with truth and grace. Always offering the invitation for someone to come to Jesus. Never giving up as long as you draw breath in your lungs. That's the goal. That's our mission. Let's get to it. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you for your word, the power that comes in it. Father, two words, two simple words, three letters with a space in between that is more powerful than anything we can ever imagine. When Jesus spoke, people were required to listen. He granted, he was given that authority, that power in his name, in his words. And Father God, we, through the grace and mercy that you give us, can utilize that power. Lord, I pray that every single person under my voice who calls himself a born-again believer truly understands the authority that has been given to them through Jesus, that they can go out into this world and speak life into people. They can speak truth into people, and they can give grace where grace is due. So, Lord, I, play, I pray, Lord, that you challenge us, that you convict us, that you place somebody in our path this week as we celebrate Holy Week and prepare for your son's death, burial, and resurrection to celebrate what Easter is truly about, that you will place somebody in our lives this week that we can go up to them and speak truth and speak life into them and invite them to church. Invite them to come and see what Jesus can do for them. And Lord, I pray that you continue to convict us to get rid of the sin in our life and to turn ourselves over to you more so.
today than we did yesterday. Father, I pray you keep us all safe this week where we go today and the remainder. Bring us back at the next appointed time where we can continue to grow closer to you and each other. Father, bring us back this uh, Thursday for the Seder meal. Lord, that we can sit down and break bread with brothers and sisters and learn what your, bro- what your apostles and your disciples did at your last supper. And again, bring us back this Saturday evening to participate and watch what truly transpired when the moment when Jesus went to that cross and died for our sins. Keep us safe, guide us and direct us. And as always, we ask nothing but your will to be done. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless.